I got to confess, um, I didn't realize how lucky I was until last week when I, got, I, I this was not on my agenda. Um, but basically, the, the way this should have been introduced to me was, Peter, you're getting a chance to meet and talk to one of the most important people in the world. You, you look unassuming, but you run the Google Play Store, which means you can make and break the, the lives of, of lots of developers. You control millions and billions of dollars. It's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous uh, weight on your shoulders, but you seem to be bearing it up okay. Uh, well, I look after the ecosystem. We do have an editorial team which actually looks after the store to keep like church and state separate. Um, I actually feel I work for developers, so like an inverted pyramid. So yes, I have a really great job, let's, which let's I love every day. This is a very sophisticated audience, but let's assume they're less sophisticated. Let's just sketch out the size of, of the Google Play, the Google app ecosystem. How many folks are coming through the store? How many folks are, are buying things? How many developers are pushing th apps through the store every day? Um, well, thousands of apps a day, uh, 190 countries. You can buy apps in 130. You can customize your uh, pricing in 65. Uh, we have different types of pricing models, $1.4 billion, a billion installs last year. I can go on and on, big numbers. Uh, but the exciting part for me personally uh, is that we have figured out that innovation has no boundaries. Uh, coming from India, and especially thinking about things like emerging markets and living in Silicon Valley, I love the fact that we don't have a monopoly on innovation. Even though I live in Silicon Valley, I'm a very big part of the Silicon Valley. Uh, whether it is in Turkey or Africa or India or Brazil, we're seeing amazing things come in. And if that's what I would, what I like to talk about is that it's boundaryless. So boundaryless sounds good. It means there's an enormous opportunity. Lots of there's lots of open field. There's but there's a perception among developers I talk to, investors I talk to, who say, actually the app world is already done. Um, you, your new app is going to be a failure. Statistically, you can't get in. The, the door is essentially closed. Um, there's a Comscore stat that says the number of Americans, uh, the average number of apps that they're downloading per month is now zero. Um, if you've got a new app, basically there's zero chance of you getting it to a lot of people. Um, I'm assuming you don't agree with that perspective, but you must agree that at least the odds are stacked against you. Well, you know, I think from the beginning of this session, we always heard about stuff, people saying the internet was going to die in 93 and different things. I think these prophecies have been something we have heard all through. But let me talk about what it takes for somebody to truly get discovered, and how are we finding amazingly interesting apps? Because I think that is something that might be useful for everyone to think about. I think of two things. There's a whole bunch of tools that Google provides, and we'll talk about what, what those are. And second, always tap into the collective intelligence of your community. And we'll talk about both of those very quickly. At Google, we believe on iterative software development. Tons have been written about Google's iterative software development. We took that philosophy and we said, how do we create a frictionless approach for people to write apps? Today, people are innovating because you don't have to get approved. You can write an app, you can try it out. Four important pieces that you could think about. One, you have the ability to beta test. You can create a community and beta test your app. And believe it or not, people give you really great feedback. Number two, there's something called a store listing experiments. You can actually A-B test your pages, your how do you write your page on the store, that is your biggest billboard, and figure out whether that particular app works for that particular economy. Let me give you some examples. Mixi is the number one game developer in Japan had the number one revenue producing game in Japan. And they turned to me and said, you know, we're going to bring it to the United States. And we're like, you should actually try to localize and you should try to do store listing experiments. Think about telling that to somebody who has got a very, very successful game. And you know that most game developers like closet psychologists, they understand their audience, they know how to take them through the storyline, etc. Luckily, the CEO, decided to give it a go. 68% increase in conversion rate just by taking away the busyness. 
I think most of you realize, have you seen Japanese stores or Japanese websites and the United States? We do a lot in terms of also localizing and telling people how local means, etc. So that's the second thing. Third is material design. We give design guidelines and we can talk a lot about why beautiful things matter. You can see you're in good company here. And, and four, uh, we, we look at what we call reply to reviews. The most important thing about apps or any business today is your community is constantly talking to you. Your reviews tell you your community's sentiment. Most people think of reviews as QA, to say, what do I fix? The first thing I tell folks is to really think of reviews as community sentiment management, also think about what is positive. So we have a lot of tools for beta testing, store listing experiments, design, and reply to reviews. And collectively, it allows you to build great apps, but also have great advocates when your app comes out. And that's important. Because most of the stuff you're talking about is, is things you can do to improve the reception you get once someone downloads your app, right? How do you make your app better so when someone downloads it, they have a better experience? But a lot of folks aren't even getting to that point, right? There's no discovery, um, or a lot of folks are having a difficulty with discovery. There was an interesting panel on bots here. One of the this reasons I think investors uh, and some of the communities is so interested in bots is they're looking at it as a way to promote app discovery. We can't do app discovery through our traditional methods, so hopefully we'll be able to push our app to you through Facebook Messenger or another chat app. Um, to me, again, that's another signal that says the community is saying, look, traditional discovery isn't working. Another one, right, is, is, the, is the giant influx of app install ads. People saying, the only way we can get this in front of people is by spending an enormous amount of money on mobile, maybe even on TV at this point. Uh, when you guys see all those efforts, is that, is that a signal to you that, that, that you need to fix something you're doing, or is it just the market doing what the market does? Well, you know, as businesses evolve, we all have to evolve and build better tools. I do want to clarify one thing, that the beta testing is before you even get into the store and install. Uh -huh. That's pre, so you know, you can build communities out of wherever you are. So let's come back to the question, bots versus apps. Uh, if you open up your devices today and search for bot versus apps, I'm sure you'll find things on both sides. The one interesting thing that is coming out is a question is, where are you having a conversation with your audience? It's not a fix, it's another channel. If you look at Larry Page's conversations about the web for the longest time, he's talked about going from an intent-based web to an assistive web to a suggestive web. That is, today you know you search, you ask. That's the intent. How does the web assist you knowing who you are? But how does it go forward to suggest? Bots are a solution in that continuum of smarter solutions, smarter things. Now, the bigger question, what we just started out by talking about, is how do you build a great bot? Nothing comes for free. Conversational UIs are going to be the next frontier of UIs, and people are just starting to figure out what does a conversational UI mean. No, I was having this conversation with Domino's Pizza the other day. I don't know if you guys know this. They have written an app, which is a zero-click app. Zero-click, yeah? So there's a little dial. If, you're, if you click to switch on the app, of course, you have to click once, I One suppose. Click. One click, yes. If you don't do anything, there's a little timer, and in 30 seconds, you'll order the last pizza you ordered. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm like, what if you butt dial your little zero click app, right? Uh, but this is, this is. This what is, was the answer to that question? Uh, well, they talk about how there's more lock screens nowadays and butt dialing doesn't happen, et cetera. But what was interesting is that every time they did a focus group, they found people get terrified. When is the last time you've seen, wow, people are getting terrified, let's launch the app? <laughs> right? This is kind of an interesting thing. So, but we were talking to them about an interesting concept. Think about it. Casual dining, I know, I'm, you know things like fast food, etc., are really thinking about how do I reduce time, but more importantly, how do I get things to people really quickly? Pizza is the only one who's fo solved the delivery problem. Kind of interesting, right? But we were talking to him about how long does it take for somebody to actually order pizza? And what would it look like in a bot? 
Like, how would you think of topics? How many conversations would you need to have? How, many, how much intelligence would the bot need to know? Kind of interesting, right? So on the one hand, you have this zero click. On the other hand, we're saying, what are the conversations that needs to have so that anybody can order pizza? So it's early. I, I, we are excited about it. Uh, you know, anything to do with machine learning, artificial intelligence is something Google gets very excited about. Uh, but we are really spending time to understand what conversational UI looks like. Can, can we talk, a, we don't have a ton of time, but can we talk a little bit more about advertising and, and how much, um, what's a reasonable sort of expectation if you're a developer? How much money do I need to spend promoting my app? Um, at what point do I decide, you know what, I've, I've paid a lot of money to push this out through app install ads, TV ads, whatever. It's, the community's not responding. Is there sort of a rule of thumb you can offer people? Like if you've done it for two months and you don't have traction, stop? Well, you know, um, it's math at the end of the day. Uh, any kind of advertising, people who have done traditional media know, need to understand what is cost of acquisition versus your lifetime value. So uh, about a year ago, it was simpler, where people said cost per install should be less than LTV, CPI less than LTV, and you can continue to invest unlimited amount, right? You're putting a dollar, you're getting $2 back, put as much as you want. What has happened now is that the costs have gone slightly higher, and so people are getting smarter and saying, is cost per install, is LTV times some kind of organic uplift? So you need to say it's LTV of more installs. Does that make sense? Tease that, that out is, for me. Okay. So I'm not as smart as the audience. <laughs> Sorry. So earlier they were looking one is to one. If I spend right. on an install and that install paid me more, that was sufficient. That's that part I get. Today they're saying if I pay for one and even if that install has a higher LTV, I would actually like to get a couple more organic installs, like through viral, to understanding the brand, etc. Did that person tell their friend about the app? Is that yes. what you're saying? Did the person tell the friend of the app? Did they get on a top chart? Did they get on some, you know, maybe you wrote about them? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Did it get somebody's attention? And did you get a multiplier effect to be able to know it's sustainable? However, the biggest thing that to think about is that 2016 onwards, you're moving away from an acquisition-centric world to a re-engagement-centric world. So whether you think about games, where they're moving from launching new games and a hit title after a hit title, to really thinking about live ops. Live ops are new content within your game. New You've already downloaded the app. Already We'd like you to that. use it again. Exactly. Because again, the, the, you, there's equally uh, devastating statistics to say, exactly. even if you downloaded the app, you're unlikely to use it statistically after that. So uh, there is a couple things there. So you have downloaded the game, they're trying to figure out how do you create engagement in the community because so much about gaming is about playing with others who have the same capabilities. So how do you bring people who have similar capabilities at a particular point in time for it to be exciting? Why are we all here? Because we like this community, you know, thanks to Steffi and others, right? We're here because we are kindred spirits. Same thing in gaming. How do you create that event that allows for great gamers to come together by skill set and it can be targeted, it can be given to different skill set, etc. Same thing with media apps. How many people are watching Game of Thrones, right? It's, it's a new event for the HBO app. No one is watching excitement. Game of Thrones according to this audience. I know, I was to be. HBO's in real trouble. <laughs> yes. Um, but but I, don't want, um, I don't want my phone, I don't want every app on my phone to be notifying me constantly that they've got new content, right? Eventually, as a consumer, I'm gonna learn to shut down those notifications and say, hey, stop, stop bothering me, or I'll delete the app altogether. It seems like this is a short-term fix. Well, in an interesting way, uh, apps have actually figured out very smart ways to notify. Um, you know, there is three things that we are finding and how, again, it's a conversation uh, that, you're, that you're going to have with your audience. One is time-based. Uh, people find that for certain kinds of things, you are spending certain time. Uh, anybody who's you know, shopping on Gilt or Rulala, which is all New York based, they think that they're doing it at lunch and I'm at 9 a.m. in the morning in the middle of my meetings and I'm like, what am I going to do, right? So you understand there's a timing based. Uh, and most of the time it's because you have opted in. But you're talking about the individual apps getting smarter about notification, but you have a tragedy of the commons, right? Where I've got, a, 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 again, a phone full of apps even if each one of them is individually smart about how they're notifying me and saying, pick me up, pick me up, but uh, doing it sporadically, I've got a phone full of them. Eventually, as a consumer, I'm just going to say, you guys should all shut up. 
Well, what we find is that everything doesn't happen all the time. And I think it's just like, you know, how often are you looking at email or how often are you looking at messaging? So for example, most newspapers have thought about it as breaking news and points in time. That if there is, and so it's the restraint that people are spending on how they notify. Because if every person, marketing is an exercise in restraint. I keep telling people this. Right? Any kind of advertising, any kind of marketing, any kind of conversation is an exercise in restraint. And so people who understand it and think about you, Peter, when do you need to engage with me and how do I make it useful, those notifications work. Speaking of restraint, yes, we're being told we have to get off stage. All right. <laughs> we're going to leave it there. I think marketing is an exercise in restraint is a, is a great thing to keep in your head the rest of the day. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.